Hello, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube. I am Clementine, and as always, I am Super Saiyan. But never mind that. In this video, I'll show you a simple hack to make a Guitar 2 preamp for under $30. I will also show you a simple way to customize this preamp to sound like any amp you love, or that unique tone you hear in your head, but it hasn't been invented yet. I will show and explain the entire process in detail including simple diagrams that anyone could understand. Then we'll hook it to a Fender Tweed clone and see what it do, as well as how it reacts to pedals. And finally, we'll find out if we can use it to achieve a tone similar to Hendrix at Woodstock. I believe you all be surprised when you find out how easy and simple this build really is. So, if this sounds like something you might be interested in, stay tuned! Oh, that beautiful bean footage. The very first thing that I have to do in this video is give a shout out to PD Two Finger. He is the one that turned me on to the device that will make this project so easy and cheap. This is a pre-assembled stereo tube pre-amplifier from eBay. They make these in several different ways and some configurations are as cheap as $17. I will put a link to this unit in the description. These have a screw pin header at the end so you can cut wires and hook this up even if you can't solder. But if you would like to solder this in permanently, you can solder the, these points right on the bottom. These can be powered from a 12 volt AC wall wart adapter. But don't let that fool you into thinking this is a low voltage device. Disclaimer. This device contains a boost converter, and although there's only 12 volts going in, there are capacitors on this device rated for 60 volts. That probably wouldn't kill you, but it wouldn't feel very good. And I do know for a fact it will make a very loud bang and a bright flash. If you would like more information on this device, PD Two Finger made two videos on it when he was doing his build, and he has some good in-depth information. Here's one place that I got lucky. I have a switch in line on my my AC adapter so I won't need to use a switch in the unit. Now there may be somebody out there saying, why are you using this cheap thing? Can you not make your own tube preamp? Well, you certainly can, and I have. It does offer just a tiny bit more customization to the circuit, but who wants to take all this and try to figure out how to place this on a circuit board and then solder all that up. Ain't nobody got time for that. Especially if you're just starting out or or like me, you just don't feel like messing with all that when these things work so great. So let's solder up a jack and see if it even works. Now you can hook this up if you don't even know how to solder. You can just cut the end off of the wall wart wire and strip the wires back and stick them into the two labeled screw junctions and tighten them down. It, since you're dealing with AC, it doesn't matter whether you don't have to deal with positive and negative. You have a hot and a common and they're interchangeable. So let's see if it's a dud. And I'll go ahead and say that uh, the unit that PD and I both purchased was fine. There has been no issue. And for something this inexpensive, that's fantastic. Look at those filaments glow. You see, this is the real deal. If you pull the tubes out of this, the sound is gonna stop. It is actually the tubes that is doing the amplification. So this is the jack terminal box that I'm gonna use to test the unit. It's just a decorated wall outlet box that I've put uh, two jacks in and a potentiometer that can be hooked to alligator clips so that you can turn different things up and down when you're breadboarding a circuit. Also, don't judge the tone of this device during this part of the video. I'm just running it through a little bench practice amp with like a four inch speaker. It's gotta be at least one person out there that just said, wait a minute, now how are you gonna hook a one channel guitar to a two channel stereo amp? Well, there's several different ways to do that and that's why we need to go to a diagram. So we got two vacuum tubes or as they say in Europe, valves. That's actually a good description of how they work but I'm not here to explain how tubes work and these diagrams will be made super simple. Each one of these tubes actually contains two gain stages inside, but we'll just represent them with one single tube. There's one for the left channel, one for the right channel. So we have a guitar and a little practice amp. 
So for this first test, just to check for the amount of gain that we're getting and to see if we're passing signal, we're just gonna go from the guitar into the right channel vacuum tube and we're gonna come out of that same tube and go into the amp. So you can see here, I'm just screwing these wires into the terminals. Once again, if you didn't want to solder or you don't know how to solder, you could just take a cheap guitar cord and cut it in half, strip the wires back and screw them in. So let's okay, see what we so got. I had to flip my wires around. And you can hear there's interference because of all this stuff going on around here and that right beside the wires, but. That's distortion. This is only one stage, one tube, this tube. So. Oh, they're not microphonic either. Time to get a guitar. So, we got a Squire. Let's plug it in. Oh, it's in D. Let's go to the humbucker. through both stages that's going to be doing good so to do this we're going to leave the right side tube hooked up to the amplifier and we're going to hook the guitar to the left side tube and then as a test we're going to run a jumper between them you gotta love these screw terminals it's just so easy to do this now let's see what that gives us <laughs> That sounds like shit because of way too much gain going through there and I'll show you how we can make it sound really good and also however we want it. So obviously this isn't the best situation. Uh, one way that you could take that gain down in the middle is to simply install a potentiometer here and this would be your gain pot. Now once again, if you can't solder, you can pull a resistor out of anything. That's that little thing that looks like a tube with little color stripes on it. It's like a knob that's turned down at different levels. You can decode it by the stripes on it, but the best thing to do if you don't know what you're doing is just jerk a couple out of some old electronics and try them out. But there is a better way to do this. If we're gonna get rid of some of that gain, we might as well make it do some work on the way out, put it to some use. And for this, you need a tone stack. This is basically an equalizer for the preamp. For the most part, the design of a tone stack is why a Fender sounds like a Fender and why a Marshall sounds like a Marshall. Now I do understand that these devices may use different types of tubes, different type of circuit, but the majority of that signature sound for every brand or type of amplifier is coming from that tone stack. This is how you can make a Dumble Overdrive pedal or a Marshall clone pedal or what is commonly called an amp in a box. And these pedals don't even use vacuum tubes, but we'll get into that later, and only briefly. Another good idea would be to put a volume knob on the output of that second tube. That way we can have those tubes really cooking and making some grit, but we don't have to hit the amp super hard with it. And that's a master volume that will allow you to decide whether you want your distortion to come from the tubes in this box or the tubes in your amp. You could turn this way down and turn your amp way up and give yourself a ton of clean headroom on a normally broken up amp. So how do we get one of these tone stacks? Well, you may be able to find a small unit like this tube unit on Amazon, Wish, eBay, that is a tone stack. But if you're going for a specific amplifier sound, you can look up the schematic of that amplifier and copy the tone stack section. But what if you want something your own? You wanna make your own tone stack with your own sound, or you want a similar sound to one of those amps, but you don't have those exact parts on hand. Well, that's where you come with a tone stack calculator. This will do the math for you. You don't have to have an engineering degree. You don't have to get out a calculator. You can look one of these up on Google, 
download it. It'll have Fender, Marshall. It shows the Big Muff tone stack. It shows a box and dial tone stack. You can move all the controls around and see what kind of EQ curve you're gonna get. That Tweed Champ clone I got is a uh, very warm. It, I'd call it muddy. It was made for an eight inch speaker and it has a 10 inch speaker in it. So it's bass heavy. It shakes the ground in here. It tries to move stuff off the walls. And with that 60s Alnico 10 inch being so bassy and so efficient, so loud, when you turn it up enough to get it to break up good, you, you don't want to be around it and I'm sure the neighbors don't love it. So I need to create a variation on the Vox Tone Stack that has a dip right where my amp has a peak so I can get more of a flat response. That'll sound a lot better and work way better with pedals. And like here, here's where the Tone Stack calculator is so great. I don't have any one meg pots, but I do have some two meg pots, two MBs. We can plug that in here, see what difference it makes. Okay, I also don't have a capacitor this small. I don't have any capacitor in the picofarad uh, range, but I do have a one nanofarad. And as you can see, that just messes everything up. I'm glad I have that because I would have tried it and it would have not been any good. So I got to go hunt through the junk closet for a smaller capacitor in the picofarad range. And I found two. These are vintage ones from the 70s from an old TV circuit board. That makes them cooler, huh? <laughs> and I'm not worried about it. There's not going to be a lot of power going through these and these disc capacitors like this virtually last for 50, 100 years. So after messing around with it and plugging in what parts I have and seeing what results I could get, this is the final circuit that I came up with. Now I need to transfer this circuit to real life. So you can see here, I've transferred this circuit to a pad per hole piece of arrow. I only did this because it'll be easy to mount and it makes a contained unit. Uh, you can also just poke some holes in cardboard put some pots in there and wire it up just like it looks on the diagram, that's a whole lot easier. But it may be harder to mount and take up more space. And hell, while I'm showing you this, I'll go ahead and show you the schematic. This tone stack can do a Marshall sound, a Vox sound, or a Fender sound, depending on how you tune it. I designed this a few years back for a tube hi-fi to amplifier conversion. If you go to the playlists on this channel, the whole thing is on here. Uh, you just, I think the playlist is called GE Hi-Fi to Amp Conversion. So now I just need to solder this all up and look at that. Look at that ugly soldering. You think that's gonna matter? I don't. I'm just throwing this together as quick as I can. So now let's see if it works. The way it was designed, it should sound super high pitch on this little amp. This knob is backwards. This is a cut base cut, not a base knob, because it, for me to wire it all the other way, I'd have had to do so much extra stuff with jumper wires, so I just use it as a base cut knob. <laughs> Once you go past here, you're going to turn the, that part of the tone stack off. And if we turn this part of the tone stack off as well, we're going to get full power. You know, but we don't want that unless that's the case. I think for a more voxy sound, you'd want to go up over here. I forgot to say that the tone stack probably uses two or three dollars worth of parts maybe and uh, for a chassis this ATX computer power supply that I got at an Amazon return resale store for 50 cents. All I need to do is just take this thing apart and gut it out. I would have loved to have used a fan in it but since I'm running AC I would have to run a separate DC line to that fan. It's just not worth it. It's got grating on both ends. It'll cool just fine. Ah and the reason that I'm using a metal box is so that uh, 
the jacks will ground on the box and it will create a Faraday cage around the circuit and kill the electromagnetic interference or hum. Since I'm going through two tubes, which is four gain stages, that's a, a big deal. But the power jack must be plastic because you can't have AC go into your chassis or it will cause hum. So now I was able to uh, place the preamp unit inside of the chassis and luckily I was able to use the original mounting points to mount it. This is where I got that big spark. There is the still the plastic protector under it, but I was being not very careful with it and I thought well it's been unplugged for 10 minutes it's fine no there were there were still full voltage in the caps blew a big old loud pop made smoke light pd said the same thing happened to him so i feel a little better about it uh be careful with these things if it would have popped into me i'm sure it wouldn't have felt good so now i'm measuring and marking where the tone stack can go in a way that it won't interfere with any of the parts on the preamp unit now i can go ahead and solder up my master volume pot and uh the jacks and once again, this is the same wire I always use. This is a 70s TV wiring harness wire. It's a co solid copper, but it's pre tinned It works really good. You keep an eye out on the side of the road and you can get it for free. Plus all those components in the old TVs. So now I've removed the preamp unit from the chassis again and I've laid out all my marks where everything's gonna go. I'm gonna drill pilot holes. And yes, normally you'd wanna punch these so that the drill bit doesn't walk around. But as you could see from my soldering style, I'm just banging this thing out. The whole project took maybe like two and a half hours, three hours. You could do it a lot faster if you weren't recording it. <laughs> So now that I got all my holes drilled out with a step drill, I can just start wiring everything up to those wiring terminals the way that they're gonna be hooked up. Do it all on the outside of the chassis to make it easy. Except for the power plug. That had to be put in the chassis first and then wired from the inside, but I did it before I actually put the unit in the chassis because it goes in from the outside. Now I can finally put the preamp unit inside the chassis and start mounting it as well as all the other components. Now it may not look like it pretty much due to parallax, but I'm trying to keep my signal wires away from my AC wire. It does run close to the tubes, but there wasn't much I could do about that. And the reason all these wires are twisted is to try to kill the hum a little bit. It's not as good as a shielded wire, like using a guitar cable type wire or an old RCA cable and letting the chassis be the ground and only grounding that on one end would do better at killing hum. But this is just the same way all the old tube amps were done and it's good enough for rock and roll. Now all that's left to do is throw some knobs on it and put it together. And you see you get this cool little flip door deal and you can see it better at my wire management here. and. It just needs some screws in it and it's ready to hook up to the amp, do some tests. But if you remember, I said I was gonna discuss something earlier. Don't worry, I'm gonna do a full thorough demo of this preamp. But if you've actually stuck it out this far, this will probably benefit you, especially if you're just first starting out with this kind of stuff. So you're gonna see in the demo that this is a configuration for a breakup, slightly, slightly distorted preamp. If you wanna add a lot of distortion, one way to do that is artificial clipping. You can run a line down here and place two diodes or LEDs in opposite direction tied to ground. And this will simulate an amp just being cranked. And if you wanna sound like a tube amp cranked, you need asymmetrical clipping. So on one side, you will double the diodes. This simulates the way that a plate acts, what is already charged. It can move more in one direction than the other, but like I said, I'm not here to explain how tubes work. Now you can put a switch on this line or even a knob to vary it or turn it on and off. And if you want it to sound even more gnarly, you can move it over here. Then you'll be amplifying that clip signal. Now, if you use a two gang master volume pot, which is like two pots pancaked together, two potentiometers, and when you turn the one knob, it moves both of them. They have six legs. You can move your clippers over here to that back side of the pot and hook it to the middle sweeper lug and the high side lug, the one that it will be going to when it's turned up. Now you've created an artificial gain circuit. As, as you turn up the pot and it gets louder, it will also clip more. So it will stay at about the same volume, but it will get more and more dirty sounding. And what this is really is a Klon 
gain circuit, a clon clipping circuit, but this won't make your device sound like a clon. It will just have the same type of gain and clipping structure. That magical clean to dirty with no extra volume thing. And for stronger or more subtle effect, you can place it here or here. That's personal preference. Just like this, we're using vacuum tubes. You could be using germanium transistors, silicon transistors, hell JFETs. You could do this with a dual op amp. It just has to do with what type of sound you are going for. And now what I have done is snuck in teaching the very simplest basics of guitar effects pedal building and amp voicing. Although in reality, you're gonna need a coupling capacitor between every stage. The values of these capacitors and where they are placed in the circuit at certain values has a lot to do with what it's gonna sound like. This will determine whether you've got an overdrive, a clean boost, a fuzz. These aren't the only thing that determine that, but it has a whole lot to do with it. Now, another reason to choose different amplification devices is because they all have their own power needs and power restrictions, as well as the specific circuitry that goes along with that. And in real life, you need other things like resistors or potentiometers that determine how much gain this device will put out due to changing the bias or a available amount of power that it can put out. And then of course, you have to deal with the grounds on everything in real life. But at the basis, it's very simple, baby steps. Once you have all the basics down, you can just draw up a schematic like I did here without looking at one. This would just be a simple dual inverting op amp overdrive and you could make it sound like anything from a fuzz to a insane death metal heavy metal monster thing or even just basically a buffer depending on your choice of component values and how you place them in the circuit. If you've been in this for a while, don't attack me for my oversimplification or think I'm trying to be some kind of smart ass. I hope this information helps someone out and maybe explain to someone else that tubes do sound good. Yeah, they got their own qualities, but they're not the holy grail. If it is, then why do you put a tube screamer in front of your amp with an op amp in it? Why did Jimi Hendrix use a transistor fuzz in front of his Marshall? It's like flavors of ice cream. You got chocolate, vanilla, strawberry. Hell, nowadays we got things like avocado, black bean, Swiss. And we need more of that in the guitar community. Vanilla's good, chocolate's good, but who's gonna make hot chili, chocolate, pineapple, pistachio? All right, guys, I apologize. I know this video's, uh, video is very long, but let's uh, try out this tube preamp.
turn this down and get a real hot go on it. try it with a couple of pedals see if some pedals can drive this into overdrive all right so I have a pedal chain one two three four five pedals hooked up I got a boost a overdrive a univibe or digital reverb and an octave fuzz I'm gonna start slow and start going I have this set to I messed with a little bit already I have it set to pretty neutral positions Good bit of bass, a little bit of highs added that kind of kills the bass out and just right up in the middle and the amp's on three. Hopefully it's not too loud for the camera. Alright, so... Kind of out of tune, but that don't matter. We don't need tuning where we're going. So, a little bit of reverb. Let's put a little boost on the end of that reverb. that just about does it for this video if you found this educational or entertaining in any way please like and maybe subscribe 
If you have any ideas for a future video, like maybe you want me to actually explain how a tube works in a video, or maybe do tube and solid state devices and explain the theory of operation on those, stick that down in the doobly doo below. If you have some kind of question, don't be afraid to ask. If you want to learn further about this little tube preamp device and see another build done in a stereo configuration in a much different way, I'll put the links to PD's videos uh, on this subject in the description. And if you like this kind of thing, check out his channel. He can show you stuff like how to build a practice amp to use with a multi-effects pedal for $5. Well, anyway, I'm Clementine. You've been watching Heavy Metal ATC. See you next time!